Good evening. Thank you all for joining us. We're really excited for you to be part of our Radiology Career Landscape webinar tonight. We do have several people logging on. Everybody will be coming on in mute mode, um, but we will go ahead and get started once we see the participant number slow down just a little bit so nobody misses any of the good information we have to share tonight. Again, welcome. We're so excited for you to be here with us tonight. We still have people logging on to the webinar, so we'll wait for that to slow down just slightly, and then we will go ahead and get started. Um, just so you are aware, there is a Q&A function where you can type in any questions that you may have um, that any of our speakers um, get you thinking about tonight. So go ahead, send us some questions. We'll get those answered at the end of the webinar tonight. All right, so it looks like things are starting to slow down just a little bit. So we'll go ahead and get things kicked off with Dr. Elizabeth Hawk tonight. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It is a pleasure to have all of you on with us tonight. Um, just a few housekeeping uh, instructions before we get going. There will be a question and answer um, following the presentations tonight. So we hope you will join us for that. You can use the chat box to ask any questions. Um, the questions will be visible to myself and the panelists and we will try and get through as many of them as we possibly can. So joining me tonight, I have a lineup of fantastic speakers. Uh, we have Dr. Krishna uh, Nalamshetty, who is the president of Radiology Associates of Florida, uh, executive vice president of Radiology Partners, and an associate professor of radiology and cardiology at the University of South Florida. Also joining us is Dr. Eric Roran. He is the professor and chair at the Department of Radiology at the Baylor College of Medicine and co-director for our Radiology Partners Research Institute. Now, any fantastic discussion uh, entertains the diversity of opinions, so we did want to bring an outside guest, um, Dr. David Humans, who is a diagnostic and interventional radiologist at Princeton Radiology um, and an attending radiologist at uh, Penn Medicine Princeton Healthcare System. So we thank him for joining us tonight to provide his own opinion. Um, we have a saying in Radiology Partners that radiology really is a team sport, and I would be remiss if I didn't give a special thanks to Dr. Rich Heller, who has been a guiding voice of inspiration for us all tonight, um, as well as Sarah Smith and Eddie Robles and many others behind the Radiology Partners team who have helped put this all together for you tonight. So thank you for being part of our team sport. So that brings me to sort of frame our discussion for this evening. Uh, I'll touch briefly on the past, the present, and the future of really the radiology job market and, and what things are looking for us, uh, like not only right now, but really for the future. So if we talk about the past, think back to maybe when we were all at RSNA and McCormick Center. Um, radiology seemed like it had a really bright future. Uh, the ACR Commission on Human uh, Resources completed their 2019 workforce survey. Everything looked very stable. The predictions were um, much like they were in the years to come. The workforce was showing a lot of stability. Uh, multiple radiologists coming out of training had multiple job offers. 
Um, and really they could choose what they wanted in terms of best fit for their lifestyle and their professional development. Uh, but then unfortunately we got hit with a new challenge and that was COVID-19. And that brings us to the present. And now all of a sudden our, our um, digital media sources, our phones, our texts, our, our daily interactions are filled with new challenges, um, as you can see. Uh, we're at a point now where we're hearing reports of radiologists being furloughed. Uh, closing imaging centers, compensation reductions, even rescinded job offers. Um, we're hearing reports of some new hires starting on furlough and maybe less opportunities as senior radiologists, maybe even pushing off retirement. We're hit with a whole new set of challenges ahead um, and it's really forced us to rethink, reframe our thinking um, and, and really come together to figure out what the future is going to look like. So that brings us to the future and, and our discussion moving forward. What will the future look like over the next one to three years? And the future is maybe not the same for all different types of radiologists. And the story may read differently uh, for academic practices, for large and national private practices, and for traditional private practices. So the point of this webinar is to really take an honest look at the job market over the years to come and hear perspectives from all these different practice types. But the point of what today is, is that we're all asking common questions. Will there be jobs for me? Are practices stable? Uh, what will my future look like? Um, and what we really hope to try to do today is to answer these questions for you. So my hope is that this webinar today leaves you with a diversity of opinions, realistic answers, and hopefully a sense of true pride and optimism in moving forward. I have a piece of art on the wall of my office by an artist that I love. Uh, it's an artist named Reggie Black. And it simply says in graffiti writing, the future belongs to the brave. And I would offer to each of you tonight that the future does not belong to me or the speakers on this call, but the future truly belongs to each of you. So thank you for joining us tonight. And I hope you will enjoy the speakers to come. And I look forward to addressing your questions following that. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, as was introduced at the beginning, my name is Eric Warren. I'm the chairman of the radiology department at Baylor College of Medicine. And for the last five years or so, have worked closely alongside radiology partners. We have an affiliation between the college and radiology partners, particularly focused around clinical mission, research, education, you know, really all the components that go into an academic medical center. And, and as was mentioned, I'm the co-director of the Radiology Partners Research Institute. So let's go to the next slide. So COVID has definitely presented a major challenge to the way we live our lives, the way we practice medicine, the way we go about our business. And so uh, I've heard a lot of airline analogies as people talk about the challenges presented by COVID and the response to it. Uh, essentially, we were flying high in a fairly, you know, high caliber, technologically advanced airliner, and COVID came along and we had to shut down our operations in a very quick period of time. Uh, we had to land the plane. It wasn't a perfect landing. It wasn't a pretty landing. But like most practices in the country, we ratcheted back our practice uh, in order to protect ourselves, to protect our patients, and to comply with local and state regulations in terms of public, uh, public activity. And so the challenge now is to get this airliner back in the air. Uh, and I'll show a little bit of data on this. This is publicly available data that comes from Texas Medical Center showing really our local experience here in Texas. And I would just emphasize that a lot of what we'll be discussing tonight will depend on your particular region, where you are and what the particular impact of COVID has been. Uh, but this shows the infection rate in the greater Houston area. Uh, and if you go forward one more slide, this is the trend of positive cases that we saw. And so you can see in the early phase from kind of late mid to late March up until early April, uh, we were seeing kind of a geometric increase in the number of cases we were seeing in the Houston area. And I think if you advance one more, there will be an overlay graphic 
this is what we were worried about. This was kind of the trajectory that we were on in the Houston area, and I think this is the trajectory that we saw in many places of the country. And we were worried that we were gonna start replicating what was taking place in Lombardy, Italy, in New York City, and other places where the number of cases really did take off. And so, as with most places in the US, we instituted social distancing measures, we closed down non-essential businesses from the standpoint of our radiology practices, that means that we stopped doing screening mammograms, we rescheduled non-essential studies that were coming in, and you can see from the actual data since that time that we did manage to flatten the curve. And this is really replicated nationwide in most cases that the number of COVID-19 positive cases continues to increase, but it increases at a fairly steady and manageable rate. So next slide. As we look at the situation now, we're really, position to be able to start to resume our activities. And so we look at a journey from a patient needing care, and that care has been put off now for a uh, period of time. So we initially said we're going to look at cases that are non-essential, non-urgent, and schedule them at some point in the future. But as we know about medical conditions, there are not too many purely elective medical procedures, maybe cosmetic surgery, maybe some other things, but you know, there's a reason we do screening mammograms. There's a reason we do colonoscopies. There's a, there are therapeutic options for patients that can maybe temporize a little bit, but non-urgent conditions can fairly quickly become urgent conditions. And so now we're looking at this journey to connect the patient needing care with the appropriate procedure. So go ahead and advance the slide. There are several different things we need to consider along the way, compliance with local, regional, and state regulations. Like I said, we can't outstrip what the general regulations for the public are. We need to create and maintain a safe environment within our medical systems, and one more, as well as protect our capacity and resources. And that capacity and resources includes ICU beds in case we do see a future surge, as well as our PPE. So go ahead and advance. Now, as you look at the perspective from the Academic Medical Center, and I'm using Baylor College of Medicine as an example, but I think this is replicated in many different academic medical centers, we have a fairly diverse portfolio. So as we look at the impact of COVID-19 on our operations, it's a little bit heterogeneous even within our own system. So we have Baylor College of Medicine itself. We have a faculty group practice and a private medical system associated with Baylor College of Medicine. Next slide but we're also partners with a national healthcare firm, uh, CHI, Catholic Health Initiatives, and we have CHI Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center, as well as several regional facilities around the Houston area. We have the Harris County Health System, so we're part of the county hospital uh, system, part of Harris County. Next slide. We provide service to the VA Medical Center here in the, in the Houston area, and this is the largest VA medical center in the country, as well as Texas Children's Hospital. And so as we look at the impact of COVID and look at the resumption of normal activities, it is a little bit diverse amongst this. Now we keep in mind too, next slide, that within an academic medical center, we have a variety of missions. So we do provide clinical care, that clearly is a part of our, our mission, but we also are an academic medical center, a learning health science university with very deep involvement in research and education missions as well. Next slide. And so this is how things look right now. Uh, we are in the midst of planning a return to normal operations. And the, the graphic I'm showing is just kind of a stepwise increase in activities. Uh, we basically fell to about 40 to 50% of our activity within the radiology service line. Uh, and much of that was intentional. Like I said, we, we put off doing elective procedures. We put off doing non-urgent procedures until we could get a better grasp of what COVID impact was going to be in our particular area. Uh, but then we started ratcheting back up. And so we looked at phase one would be a resumption up to about 60% uh, of normal activity. Phase two would be up to 80%. And phase three would be up to full activity 100%. And that would include things like surgery, endoscopy, uh, cardiology procedures, really the full spectrum. Now what we're seeing, and I'll spend a little time on this slide just giving you a, a glimpse of our current situation. Uh, what we see is that that radiology is leading the way uh, in this resumption of normal activities. And that really makes sense. And it really emphasizes uh, something that I've known in my mind, and that is how essential radiology services are to the practice of modern medicine. 
you know, patients who are being planned to come back in for their surgery two or three weeks from now are getting their CT scans today. And if they can't get those CT scans today, that surgery is probably going to be further pushed into the future until they can get appropriate imaging. And so even though we're really technically at phase one right now, from the radiology operations standpoint, we're up to about 85 to 87 percent of our normal activity already. And in some particular service lines, we're, we're pushing above 100 percent already, rate, uh, making up for the backlog. When we look at the oncology service line, for example, patients with cancer really couldn't wait during the COVID, uh, the COVID crisis, and they needed their care. They needed their imaging studies. They needed their lines placed and interventional procedures. And so we really didn't see much of a fall off in those patients. They continue to come in for the services that they needed. Um, and so we actually are currently recruiting a couple of new positions. Uh, now, some of those positions are within the more public realm. So uh, the county hospital system had approved some positions for us. And again, a, a public system operates on a very different principle than a, than a private system. So we're continuing with those recruitments. But we anticipate that, that we are going to need additional radiology faculty uh, over the next couple of months, and we expect to see the need for those and the uh, approval for those positions opening up as well. So let's go ahead and advance the slide. You know, just to wrap up, and I don't want to take up a whole lot of time because we have some outstanding speakers and I'm anxious to hear their perspective as well. You know, my opinion has always been that this is a great time to be in radiology, and certainly the last you know, six to eight weeks to 12 weeks have been a challenge for us. Uh, it, it really has turned the system on its head and the entire country on its head. But that has not shaken my uh, faith in the, uh, the fact that radiology is a great career. Uh, like I said, the future of healthcare will be driven by imaging. And a lot of the metrics that we look at from a modern healthcare system, such as efficiency and cost effectiveness, are going to uh, rely on radiology to be able to do that. AI, I know there's a lot of discussion around AI. Uh, I think if we had asked this question two years ago, there would have been a lot, of, a lot more fear and, and uncertainty about the impact of AI in radiology. Now that we're starting to see some of the AI impact on the practice and actual products come into the marketplace, I think most of us are feeling much more comfortable that AI is really going to augment what we do and not replace radiologists for the future. Uh, and so I, for one, am looking forward to a future where AI is going to be part of my system you know, I'll be sitting in the cockpit of a, of a spaceship and, and running AI in the background to help me do my, do my job in the most efficient way possible. And then finally, it's really interesting. I think the COVID situation has put a lot more emphasis on telehealth and remote visits and the ability to bring patients into your system in a way so that when they actually walk in the door, they're ready for something to be done to them rather than the preliminary work of interviews and imaging review and things like that. And I've seen firsthand how critical radiology is to that because, you know, much of what the clinicians will talk about during those initial telehealth visits or even follow-up telehealth visits is the result of their imaging studies, the patient's imaging studies. Um, so I am very confident that radiology is here to stay. It's a great career. I know that it's a little bit of a scary time with COVID and the dip that we all took. But coming from the perspective of a place that is looking like we're, we're emerging from the COVID lockdown and not seeing a huge increase in the number of cases. Of course, we're going to continue to monitor and make changes as appropriate, but we're seeing a fairly rapid resumption of normal activity uh, and expect to see fairly normal operations by this summer. Uh, so I think by the time many of you will be coming out, uh, I think radiology will be on very solid territory and, and it's just a great time to be in radiology. So I'll close my segment of it there and turn over the microphone. I'll be here for answering questions at the end and look forward to hear what all you have, all of you have to say. So I'll next turn the uh, slides over to my good friend, Dr. Krishna Nalman Shetty. Oh, my apologies, Dr. Humans is next. Good evening. Let me first check to make sure you're able to hear me. Yes. Perfect. Special thanks to all of you for inviting me to speak this evening to Dr. Rich Heller and Elizabeth Hawk and to the support staff. Really appreciate it. I'm Dave Yeomans. I practice in a medium-sized private practice 
environment, providing service at private offices and medium-sized community hospitals. We are located in the New York metro area, sort of expanded about halfway between New York and Philadelphia. So we really were in the thick of, thick of this uh, COVID storm. I'm happy to report that we are on the trailing end of our curve and um, we're seeing that uh, that admissions and, and folks uh, being treated for COVID are uh, not only leveling, leveling off, but decreasing. So. Um, I have sort of a, a forward look at, at what some of those things that we just heard about might look like. Next slide, please. Um, this is a scary time throughout medicine. Whether you're entering training, whether you're in training, leaving training, even practicing in almost any medical specialty, the future is suddenly a lot less clear for all of us. I want to focus, we'll focus on our field of radiology this evening and try to discuss those things that are relevant to those of you who are in training and those of you planning to pick up your first job out of training. I prepared for this by speaking to trainees and group leaders around the country and I'll try to distill what I have learned as we speak this evening, but I also recognize that I'm not going to be able to address all your concerns and questions and I would encourage you to be liberal um, with your questions at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation this evening. It's worth focusing on bright spots. It's a good place to start. On the bright side, just eight weeks ago, um, we really had no idea what today would be like for us. State governments were discontinuing non-essential services. That included elective imaging, procedures in many states. Many folks in training positions were finding that their caseloads were dropping. They were redeployed to other areas. My gratitude to those of you who represented us as radiologists well and all those all those opportunities for stepping up. But even then, eight weeks ago, we were confident that there would be light at the end of this COVID tunnel. We just didn't know how long that tunnel would be. And I'm delighted to say we're getting a glimpse of that light now. Many practices had revenues down precipitously at the peak of this uh, terrible pandemic, some greater than 75%. And that left many practices uh, across the country with diff very difficult financial decisions that had to be made office and technical staff layoffs, furloughs uh, have been nearly universal, and radiologists, like physicians in nearly all specialties, have taken temporary pay cuts. So what does this mean for uh, new and entering radiologists? Well, it's going to vary by practice and region, as Dr. Rohrer suggested. Uh, many radiology groups have already seen volumes begin to recover. I know ours has. Um, although some senior radiologists seem to be holding on to uh, weather the storm, recognizing that some of their retirement savings may have dwindled with the stock market drops, I know at my practice, senior radiologists are actually accelerating their, accelerating their retirement, anxious to step away, start their new life, um, make room for young folks coming in. Other senior radiologists who are not at retirement age have actually been voluntarily taking time off in my and other practices to support get reduced schedules, revenue streams, and, uh, and allow um, the younger folks to, um, to sort of keep their, their work schedule up and, and keep some of their uh, revenue stream up as we all have sacrificed during this. We've been really helped as have uh, a lot of uh, businesses throughout the country by government loan programs, grant programs that has accelerated recovery and allowed us to keep many of our very um, dear employees active and employed, um, and many groups have actually called, uh, got their retirees working part-time, um, which leaves them some flexibility and scalability. Um, remember that new hires are more cost efficient, so, um, so there's uh, at least some incentive to hire on top of the things that we just talked about. Next slide, please. A lot of unknowns though, there, there are a lot of variables that will impact how quickly practices begin to return to what they consider their new normal. They're considering things like what percent of delayed exams will be actually recovered? Are they all pent up or will some of them never come back? How many patients will end up unemployed, lose their health insurance and either delay or ignore their imaging needs and their medical needs? And the real question is how long will radiology groups need to regain the confidence in their successful future to go back to sort of behaving normally from a business standpoint? 
The experience for trainees entering the job market will have important new variables with new unknowns, and those are going to require some real thought and planning on your part. Some of the questions you're going to be asking and thinking about and that are going to be difficult to answer, but I'll give you some clues on how to get started on that. Are practices, are hospitals financially viable? Are they planning to consolidate? These are things that are gonna have a tremendous impact on your revenue stream, on your ability to hold down your job, on your ability to stay where you chose to live. It's gonna change interviews, the way they're run. It's gonna change your opportunity if you're coming out right now in your ability to really tour a practice, get a feel for the people, get a feel for what they do during the course of the day. It's gonna make it difficult to do due diligence for those who are coming out and looking for new jobs. It's gonna mean delayed start for some new hires. After discussion, we had a big hiring season this year, and after discussion with our new hires, our new hires are starting a few months later for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is it could be very difficult moving to a new place right now and not having the revenue stream to be confident that you can take care of yourself and your family with rent or mortgage. So they are putting together fallback plans that they've sort of had to cobble together quickly, but I'm going to tell you tonight that's something that you're going to want to think about. As you move out, are you going to be looking forward to reduced work hours? Is there going to be more remote reading and less reading centrally where there's a collegial atmosphere, if that's important to you? And are there going to be opportunities and are you going to be allowed to supplement income if you need to? So those are just a few things that you're gonna to wanna to be thinking about. And again, I'll be anxious to answer specific questions in a little bit. Next slide, please. With respect to searching for your job, really, I don't think those search criteria probably have changed very much for most of you. Many things remain the same. Through introspection and networking with colleagues and mentors, that's gonna help you define your priorities so that you know what you want and more importantly you understand you really understand what you need defining your priorities for your career there are so many different priorities then and they're all very personal but obviously there's job type and traditionally we've divided that into academic and private practice but as you know tonight there are a lot of other options there are corporate options there are options and research and pharmaceuticals. And that doesn't just mean uh, where they're developing drugs specifically, but there are areas where people are actually reading studies um, for, uh, for pharma companies. There's also consulting opportunities in the finance world. All things to think about, not just as a primary uh, opportunity, but also to keep in the back of your mind as a way to bridge gaps if they should arrive down the road. Location's obviously important. Relationships are very important if you have family or friends or if you're very tied to a geographic area. And then time versus money. And that's something that uh, is, is very personal to each of us. Work harder and, 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 uh, and make more or spend, take more time for yourself and your family. Um, but so those job search criteria really haven't changed. But you all are going to have to temper your expectations a bit. You're going to have to be prepared to take some risks. You're gonna to have to be prepared to make some decisions on less information than those of us speaking on the call tonight had at the time because there's simply less. Most importantly, try to have a fallback plan of some sort. Is there something else you can do? That something else might be a second fellowship as I know some people are talking about. That second thing might be staying on and working at a VA or as a, uh, uh, an assistant um, uh, clinical um, professor of some sort teaching, it may mean actually just taking some time off to get things together that you've always wanted to do before you hit your new job. Um, but that'll be important to keep in mind because we hope and believe that all this is going to pass, but we know that there are possibilities that there can be second waves and that there are other things that could happen uh, that were that are unexpected just as this was. So I would uh, encourage you all to have at least one fallback plan and think about that anyway. Next slide, please. The job search preparation, of course, has changed a little bit. Uh, interviews for many people are being conducted virtually, and I suspect there will be a hybrid model moving forward as people become more comfortable and familiar with this. But I think it's going to be the job of you all out there to get plenty of practice contacts when you are looking at a practice so that you can reach out to them personally on a sidebar, um, particularly if you don't have the opportunity to 
tour areas and visit personally, um, it's going to be very difficult to have spontaneous conversations and ask questions that arise as you take those tours. I know folks right now um, have been accepting jobs sight unseen, which is sort of scary to me. How can you prepare for that? Well, I hope all of you have developed some mentors. If not, I would highly suggest it with uh, among folks who are at your teaching institutions and keep in touch with folks who are recently graduated. Touch base, find out what their landscape looks like. Find out if there's anybody that they know that's in a great practice that needs somebody like you. You really, I would encourage you to really um, um, sort of spend a lot of time on those relationships. When you go to apply, make sure you're asking your questions, preparing thoughtfully and thoroughly because you may not get as much of a chance to ask some of those questions unless you're willing and able to call again and again every time questions pop up. And finally, be prepared to be flexible and make decisions. These decisions for you may be temporary. You may be doing something that is not perfect for you because you haven't had the same opportunity to really prepare for everything or investigate everything. And uh, just be prepared and, and to, uh, to, to stay somewhere and try it out. I could tell you that um, out of my graduating class um, from residency years ago, probably 25% didn't stay with their first job then, and, and that may be higher now. You should feel good though about being prepared to practice. It's really scary right now as your volumes drop and your teaching cases may be sliding away, you uh, are sitting in front of your packs and not reading as much, and so you feel like you're not getting as much training. You've all been working hard. You'll continue to work hard. The volume will pick back up. There are plenty of additional learning resources available. If you uh, head on Twitter and look up hashtag FOAMRAD, F-O-A-M-R-A-D, uh, you can head down 100 rabbit holes to all sorts of speci subspecialty uh, opportunities and, and just loads and loads of learning opportunities. Remember that multi-specialists remain very valuable. So although you may be a neuroradiologist or a pediatric radiologist, if you are able to flex, if you're able to cover other areas, if you still have an interest in reading beyond your trained fellowship specialty, if you choose a fellowship, that makes you very valuable. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a moment too. We already talked about the possibility of a second fellowship, which in my opinion, and generally, at least for private practice, um, isn't necessary. And, and the opportunity cost of getting out and getting to work and uh, that kind of thing is unfortunate if you can't do it. But, but I want you to, um, to think about how you can become indispensable. Can you turn to the next slide, please? Being indispensable, of course, is going to mean that um, you are going to be somebody who's highly valued even as a younger member of the group. Um, if things become difficult, uh, especially after what you all are going through this year and probably next, you're not going to want to be the first one who's asked to scale back or consider uh, moving to a different region or practicing in a different hospital scenario. That's one of the beauties of being in a private practice for me is that we sit around the table, we have these discussions. Uh, nobody gets put in a bad position without, uh, without consent and without, um, without a lot of discussion around the table. But my, uh, my suggestion to you is be willing uh, to step up to new challenges, especially when others are reluctant. That's a scary prospect, but when you do it and you push through, you'll get recognized as somebody who's a real, um, a real player and who's really willing to bring value to the table and um, do things that some other people might not be able to do. Um, if you find yourself with some extra time on your hands, if you find yourself not yet in the job market and you're looking for things that will make you invaluable, indispensable, on the right, I've given a little bit of a list and I would encourage you to think about developing some new skill sets. For me, um, before I was in medicine, I was a surface warfare officer in the U.S. Navy. I, was, uh, I had some experience in leadership, but I've had some experience in advocacy, and that's the pathway I've chosen. I found it very rewarding. But uh, practices that you join may well not have folks who are well-versed or willing to lead on things like artificial intelligence, like Dr. Rohr was discussing. You may be able to develop a brand new service line based on your recent experience. You may be able to learn a little bit about data analytics or business intelligence or quality insurance. These are all things that many practices typically have holes in. So I would encourage you to think about these and other things because if you can bring a new skill set, that's another thing that makes you invaluable and frankly indispensable. Next, guys, next slide, please. So in closing, it's a really scary time. Um, recognize that it's scary for everyone, including practicing radiologists, and everyone is navigating right now without a really good map. You all have been working very hard to become great radiologists. 
And radiology is absolutely a field that will not only bounce back, but will advance rapidly. And I suspect will become, I think, as Dr. Rohr was suggesting, even more important and more fundamental, not only in the diagnosis, but I, th I really think in the treatment and broader care are, of our patients in the future. And I suspect that we'll become more indispensable, indispensable and we'll start leading teams uh, in pathways of care. So you all have made what I still consider to be a terrific career choice. This storm will pass. I predict much clearer skies continuing to develop in the next year or two. And I would encourage you to please feel free to contact me with questions, particularly with respect to the benefits and challenges of the private practice experience. Uh, it's probably best if you just uh, direct message me on Twitter. You see my Twitter handle there. Um, and uh, if you're looking for additional resources, let me know and uh, I'd be happy to try and help you find some more educational resources. Thank you very much. I look forward to taking questions after the next presentation. Best wishes to you all. All right, thank you, Dr. Humans. Um, as I pull up my slides here, uh, my name is Krishna Nalamshetty. Um, uh, welcome to tonight's uh, webinar. Um, and um, I'm good. the last talk for tonight is really going to go through the COVID-19 impact and uh, future state. Um, as Dr. Hawk mentioned when we first started, uh, I'm president of a practice called Radiology Associates of Florida, uh, based physically in Tampa, Florida. Um, and I also serve as an executive vice president, Radiology Partners. Um, and I have a faculty appointment with the... Um, Oh, one second, I think I'm having some technical issues here. Let's see. Apologize, I'm not sure if why the slides are coming in so small. All right, I'm gonna switch, uh, apologize, I'm gonna switch to another screen here if you don't mind. All right. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, so uh, a, a little bit about my practice, Radiology Associates of Florida. We are a large practice based in the uh, state of Florida with over uh, 100 physicians. Um, it's a private practice academic model with the University of South Florida. Um, and we have uh, a training program with residents and fellows. Um, there's a total of 32 residents and about 12 fellows, um, including an interventional uh, residency program as well. Um, and as you could imagine, given the size and scale of our local practice here in Florida, the impact of COVID-19 was pretty tremendous. Um, I think March of 2020 will be um, a time and a month where all of us will remember for the rest of our lives, not only from a professional standpoint, given the talk tonight, but obviously from a personal standpoint. It's really changed, I think, how we uh, approach what we do and what we took for granted for, for all these years. Um, now, I could tell you a little bit about um, from December when we first started seeing and hearing about coronavirus, then to become COVID-19 and reports from China, all of us were glued to the media, um, trying to understand what this virus was all about. Was it something that was going to cross over to the United States and what the impact might be locally? I, I could tell you the, as we started tracking that in January and then February, I think we started realizing that we were going to be impacted. But it wasn't until March of 20, uh, March 20th uh, in the state of Florida where we recognized that this was going to have a significant impact to our operations. The governor at that time passed um, a, a, a non-emergent medical procedure delay plan. Um, so all non-emergent medical procedures had to be postponed uh, indefinitely. The second thing that came out of this was that uh, stay-at-home orders were passed on April 1st. And at that point is where we started really seeing some significant trends in volumes across our practice. This slide shows uh, what we noticed. Uh, as you can see, pre-COVID volumes uh, labeled at 100, meaning 100% of our normal baseline, quickly dropped to about on average 50% uh, of a total decline in volumes. Um, obviously, the, depending on the setting, volumes were affected more. So for example, the red line, which shows our outpatient imaging volumes, suffered the most, uh, highly because of uh, mammography having to be postponed indefinitely. 
other screening procedures such as lung cancer screening um, and any non-emergent procedures had to be delayed. And I think what, was, what we learned very quickly was that it wasn't just those two factors that caused um, a decline in volumes, but for the first time, we saw patients having to play a risk-benefit game on their medical care. Um, is it worth it to come in for my CT scan of my abdomen because I have abdominal pain with the risk of being exposed to COVID-19 out in the community? And because of that, we saw significant cancellations. So the outpatient volumes declined more precipitously than uh, the inpatient and ER, as you would expect. Now, with decreasing volumes comes uh, an impact on revenue. And what was interesting is it wasn't a linear relationship. So if you think that we have a 50% reduction in uh, volumes, you'd expect to see a 50% reduction in revenue. That's not exactly the case. It depends on your specific practice that you might be looking at, um, which is why uh, you know, diversification of imaging is very important, right? So if you were a practice that was 100% outpatient based, you may see more of an impact on overall revenue because you've lost the global revenue and technical revenue from the outpatient imaging services. Likewise, if you were in a geography that was a hotspot, you might have had a greater impact on your bottom line to, to run your practice. Um, so it depends really on the market that you were in and the type of practice, uh, but revenues I think across the country were significantly impacted. Now, you know, I have two boys who are uh, nine and 12 years old, and, and they, they always want me to include uh, some Star Wars references in, in my talks. And, and it's amazing, you know, as you search through these, there's some pretty profound things that Yoda has been quoted as saying, and I included a couple of these here in my talk tonight. The very first one is, uh, you must unlearn what you have learned. And I think that was so apropos to what we were witnessing for the first time. Dr. Hawk mentioned some terms that you may be familiar with, but for a lot of us, these were things that for the very first time, we had to learn quickly. Um, we had to talk about forced paid time off or forced vacation, putting physicians and support teammates on furloughs, looking at adjusting uh, compensation for physicians, technologists, nurses, staff, um, across the board. It, would that be required? And, and every practice handles this a little bit differently. And, and finally, um, looking at personal conflicts, right? We have folks that might have been elderly, have other risk factors that really got them concerned about coming into a hospital environment or out into the community. We had folks had, who had to take care of kids because schools were closed. And people started thinking for the first time, uh, you know, if they were outsourcing imaging for after hours work, should we bring that back in? So these were all things that we had to kind of take a step back and what we thought was, you know, we'd never discuss became hot topics that we were adjusting daily. Now, fortunately for, for my practice, uh, one, we were fairly large uh, in the state of Florida. But um, as, as I mentioned earlier in my introduction, Radiology Associates of Florida it had partnered with a larger national organization called Radiology Partners. And with the size and scale of radiology partners, we definitely had some benefits that positioned us as well as could expect to handle this situation. So for one, we really looked at cost-saving opportunities. What do those economies of scale bring to a practice like ours? Well, if you have costs such as billing uh, with various vendors, specifically IT, uh, supplies, whether it's office supplies or outpatient imaging center supplies, um, and leases with uh, your various uh, uh, operations. Are there ways that we could take advantage of our bigger scale to benefit from decreased costs here? And, and we definitely experienced that, which helped position us from a cost standpoint uh, as best as we could for uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The other one that's a little bit unique is, as I mentioned a few slides back, um, even our local practice, Radiology Associates of Florida, was fairly diversified. We had outpatient imaging centers, we had an academic uh, division uh, where we ran the residency programs, a hospital division, and a teleradiology division. But if we take a step back and look at radiology partners, for example, you have uh, 44 different radiology practices throughout the country in various states. So if from an overall business operational standpoint, we had a diversified uh, practice. 
So we had, didn't have all of our imaging concentrated in a hot spot, for example, in New York, but rather by having this diversified group of practices collaborating together, we could withstand some of these uh, unique um, strains in local geographies. Now, the other thing that uh, was very helpful was uh, having access to increased resources. Um, sometimes, depending on the size of the practice you might be looking at, um, smaller practices may have a little bit of a challenge providing a full bench of additional resources locally. Um, things such as business intelligence was absolutely critical during this uh, COVID pandemic. So for example, looking at day-to-day -day volume changes and quickly being able to calculate what your staffing should be like to manage those changes, right? You don't wanna have 100 radiologists deployed working in a given day if there's only work for 50. Um, how do we tweak that quickly, both as volumes have started to go down, and now we're doing the exact same exercise as volumes are starting to increase. IT is another good example. Um, we, all of the physicians in our practice have home workstations, um, and even for sites that didn't have ho home workstations or remote workstations at their imaging centers or offices, uh, Radiology Partners was a, a, able to deploy over 100 PAC systems uh, within a week of COVID starting so that we could continue to provide the service uh, at our health systems and for our clients. Other things like credentialing, human resources, there's just a lot more bandwidth to help uh, manage with our local practice here in, in Florida. The other uh, component is having a, a group of teammates that are focused really on helping each of our practices uh, adapt to the situation. So. Uh, we have uh, thousands of teammates within the organization that can work on things such as operational metrics, um, clinical metrics, um, diagnosing COVID-19 and education. We'll get into some of those here in a little bit. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight briefly is the culture within the practices that you might be looking at is extremely important. And I think you're gonna see a change in the cultures now during COVID, post-COVID, compared to what it might have been two or three years ago. Um, so for example, um, in, in our specific practice, the way that we are structured is each of our independent practices, for example, mine, Radiology Associates of Florida, we look at our local revenue and we make adjustments as we see fit. Um, every practice is gonna be different. Every practice has different dynamics and different thresholds. Um, that they want to operate under, and so we could ma manage with kind of a, a locally led model. With that, you can adjust staffing however uh, your local practice feels fit, uh, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, during the downward turn, we decreased our staffing, and now we are starting to increase our staffing, and, and, and glad to report that we're actually close to original staffing um, currently. The other part is having access to things such as education. Obviously, the findings for COVID-19 were evolving very quickly, um, and we had a dedicated, cl dedicated clinical team and a, and a COVID task force that had uh, webinars, uh, meetings, and publications on how to identify COVID-19 and give us best practices on how to deal with them. So that communication piece was extremely important. How, what should we do our, at our imaging centers to keep our patients safe, to keep our staff safe? And some of these best practices were shared daily uh, as things were evolving. Um, the other thing is because of the scale, we were able to maintain benefits for our entire team, physicians, support teammates, technologists, nurses, um, uh, advanced practice providers. Um, even though some of them may have been furloughed, um, at least all of their benefits continued so they didn't have it to worry about healthcare and other things that were extremely important during this challenging time. And uh, I wanted to end on this slide with uh, just highlighting one of the things that I thought was pretty amazing. We created a fund called RP1, which was an internal fund where anybody in the organization could donate dollars, PTO, other resources to help support all of our teammates. Um, and within, I think, a period of two weeks, um, internally we raised a close to $1.8 million. Uh, and there's a committee of folks, um, uh, physicians and support teammates that look and, and receive applications from folks within our practice who have really had a hard uh, financial impact um, and, and, and we're able to support them. And I think that has really built um, the culture 
of, of this team, team sport that uh, Dr. Hawk mentioned in her introduction. Now, nobody uh, could have predicted kind of the global impact of COVID-19 and where we are today, um, you know, a few months ago. And, uh, and, and all of this was really out of anyone's control. But given everything that has happened, I think there's a few uh, things that we have adapted to um, that has really uh, positioned us well for the future. Um, one of them is growth. Um, our practice uh, in the last three months uh, during this COVID pan pandemic uh, have added uh, new sites of about 1.2 million exams, including multiple contracts with new hospitals um, that were really struggling with maintaining this, the radiology services locally um, with smaller practices. The other one is recruiting. You know, I, I, some of my residents and fellows have told me when they've contacted folks on different uh, job postings and job boards, the feedback they were getting is that um, they didn't have, uh, the positions were on hold. You know, with all of the uncertainty, everybody said, we're going to hold off on recruiting, we're going to hold off on hiring, and wait till the fall or winter before we start bringing people back on. Um, because of the scale of radiology partners, we really are looking at kind of the long play and trying to think and position ourselves for the future. We know we will get out of this and we're starting to see that now. We've hired 90 radiologists within the last three months uh, through things such as virtual job fairs, video conference interviews, increasing our online presence and information that we have for folks like you all um, and for doing virtual tours. Um, you know, we all have to adapt to the situation and we're trying to make the best of it given the circumstance. Now, where are we today? Um, I'm, the, I'm happy to say that we're starting to see that turn from the bottom. Um, as you can see here, I, I broke this out by different sites, emergency room, inpatient, outpatient, and overall. If you can just focus on the overall for a minute, we have already increased about 70% from the bottom, which we saw in the first week of April. So volumes are starting to pick up, which is a great sign. Now, here, here's my second Yoda quote for tonight, um, which is uh, difficult to see always in motion is the future. And I think that's what we're all scratching our heads right now is where do we go from here? What, what can we expect? And I think future state is yet to be determined. I could show you what we have seen. Um, the red line shows what we're actually seeing in volumes. So you see a very sharp decline and a very sharp increase, um, which is good. We were hoping that we saw that. Originally, we had projected and we looked at national projections and global projections on imaging. And you could see the two graphs that I listed out in the green and the blue showing where we thought this recovery period would be. I'm glad to see that we're ahead of that curve. But really now, where do we go from here? Um, I think it depends. If we continue along the same trajectory, we could be back to normal within a month. Um, it could take a little bit longer, as it see, you see here in line two. But if we have a resurgence as states reopen, it may be a more prolonged scenario. But I think everyone expects that this will get back to um, baseline with potentially a surge post-COVID. Uh, now, uh, the, I mentioned that I think things are going to change as well. And I wanted to highlight a few areas that I think I personally uh, envision um, things changing in the future. Uh, we've seen an increase in teleradiology, and I think telehealth will continue to grow. Um, virtual consults have been more accepted for the first time. Uh, you know, physicians, rather than coming down to the reading room, comfortable with being on video and, and FaceTiming or, you know, coming up and connecting um, with a video conference to go over cases. I think we're going to see an improvement in utilization management because I think both the patients and the physicians are being more careful about what they order. Um, given the, the risk of exposure and concerns from the, that are driven by the patients. I think we're going to see um, a very strong uh, recognition of interventional radiology because they were really frontline with a lot of the fa patient-facing um, uh, physicians in the hospitals. And the last two go hand in hand. Um, I think out of this, one thing that has been really um, encouraging is the development of physician leaders and a very strong culture within all radiology practices. I think people are really taking that team spirit to heart and have uh, stepped up to make sure that their practices can weather the storm as uh, best as possible. So with that, um, 
I'd like to conclude by just saying my vision of radiology continues to remain extremely bright. Um, you know, we have an aging population. We have increasing utilization year after year. And it looks like we are almost close to baseline in terms of volumes. I can tell you personally here in Tampa at our outpatient imaging centers, um, the, we track two things, patients that are being scanned, which are almost back to baseline, and two, um, the amount of calls that we get for patients wanting to schedule appointments, those calls have actually surpassed what we were pre-COVID, which again means that patients are starting to get comfortable with that risk-benefit analysis and are coming back to the centers. Um, our practice is actively recruiting, and, and as have you heard the other folks on the, on the conference tonight, um, I think you're going to see more of that. I think we've, we've kind of gone past the period where people are really shut down from a recruiting and hiring standpoint. And I do feel that the future is extremely bright for radiology overall, as well as for the career landscape. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Hawk to open up our Q&A. Thank you so much, everyone, for those truly fantastic talks. Um, I always love hearing what you guys have to say, so I, I really appreciate you providing your perspective. We're going to go ahead and open it up for question and answer now at this time. Um, for those in attendance, if you'd like to use the little Q&A box, um, we'd be happy to take your questions. Uh, we're going to try and address um, a diversity of questions if we can. Um, for those of you that have asked multiple questions, we'll get to what we can. Um, but all of us are always available over email and um, direct message over Twitter, et cetera. And certainly we hope that this is only the beginning of the conversation and that we can continue it from here. Um, so I've asked the panelists to sort of mark which ones they would like to answer live. And I'll give the panelists um, a few moments to sort of look over the questions. Um, I can begin by tackling an easy one that's near and dear to my heart, and that is the question on RP1. Uh, I'm one of the physician leaders that sits on the RP1 committee, um, and I truly enjoy that work. And the question was, did the organization do similar philanthropic activities? Um, we have. We have done similar activities to support um, our physician and non-physician teammates in hurricane relief in the past. And RP1 is designed not only as a way to support one another through the COVID-19 crisis, but also through other crises going forward. So our hope is that this is a lasting support system for everyone within our practice, not just during COVID-19. Um, Dr. Humans, I see you've marked as a question you'd like to answer live. Would you like to go ahead? Uh, there are a couple here. Let me choose uh, one here. Sorry, the list is pretty long. I'm happy to see, say. Um, I, I'd like to start with uh, one from Brendan Kelly. It asks if I can comment on the impact COVID has had on the perceived need for general radiologists uh, in a large group that can read across different, uh, and it keeps jumping around, so I can only, multiple specialties. There we are. Got it before it disappeared. Um, I am a huge believer in, um, in, being able to be a field player in the radiology space. Um, the current pandemic has provided an exquisite look at just how important that is as practices have had to scale up and scale down, as there have been smaller number of people in reading rooms. Um, the ability of somebody to be able to read outside their primary area of training and interest has been tremendous. Uh, well over 50% of radiologists read in at least two areas outside their area of fellowship training. Um, on a regular basis. So it's a very common sort of practice scenario and I would encourage everybody to make sure that you keep your broad skill set um, broad because it will serve you and your practices very well uh, with or without unexpected um, unexpected uh, events like we're like we're having right now. Thanks. Thanks Dr. Humans. Um, Dr. Nalem Shetty, I think you've marked a couple as well. Would you like to um, address a question of your choice? Sure. Um, there was a question here about uh, remote reading options and how we adapted to that during COVID. Um, it's an interesting question because, you know, it's been a very controversial uh, topic in radiology overall, an on-site presence versus a remote presence. One thing that was surprising to me is um, when the pandemic really hit, um, I think all of our health systems and clients were much more open and understanding of the situation and were willing to have us work from a remote setting. 
And I think, you know, it, every practice, I think, adapted to that a little bit. Um, but it, it really hit home for me personally when one of my physicians and one of my lead administrators both contracted COVID-19, um, both from the community, not worth healthcare related, but community related. And we, at that point, made a quick decision that we had to shift to uh, one, protecting our patients, protecting our staff, our, our physicians. Um, and so we did shift very quickly to a remote uh, uh, reading environment. And luckily, because of our infrastructure, we had remote stations already deployed and ready to do. So it was, a, fortunately for us, it was a flip of a switch and we had uh, about 70% of our workforce working from home. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Roran, I think you've marked a couple. Would you like to address your favorite? <laughs> We had a question about uh, recapping the perspective on the job market for new graduates going forward. Um, and, you know, as Dr. Yeoman said, I think it will be a little bit of a tough time here in the next few months because we really are not fully beyond the COVID crisis. Um, and so I know that there are people out there that, you know, their, their start date has been pushed back. You know, they may come in under slightly different terms or maybe significantly different terms than, than uh, they initially signed on for. Uh, I do think things will recover uh, fairly quickly, and I think that all of us and the, the folks that I talk to across the country are really committed to the people coming in. You know, if, if we made a job offer and we committed to bring that person in, we're going to hold by that commitment and do everything we can to to make that uh, be be appropriate and you know as close to the deal as as we possibly can. Uh, certainly from the standpoint of Baylor College of Medicine, we really haven't made any changes to the people that had committed to come in this summer. And then if we look a little bit further in the future, you know, people coming out next fall, next winter, and certainly by the following July, you know, unless again, we see something very unexpected with a second peak or a second wave or something like that, I, I think we'll be well beyond where things are now. And the folks that I talk to and the, the, the impression I get is that we really are looking for a fairly quick normalization of procedures. I always say, I think there will be things that stick with us. Um, you know, I don't think wearing masks is gonna go away anytime soon. I think we'll all be wearing masks in public for a long period of time. And I think six foot distance is probably here to stay for the foreseeable future. But when you start taking those things into consideration, we can get back to a lot of what we were doing before just with slight modification and, and Krishna, um, talked about the, or wanted to talk about the remote reading. You know, this is a way that I think this is a component that's here to stay. I think we'll all look at decentralizing our radiology operations a little bit in an effort to keep people separated uh, and do so in a way that doesn't impede our ability to have good turnaround time and customer service. You know, it's a virtual world. Here we all sit on a, on a Zoom meeting together and interacting more or less face-to-face -face in the new environment. Uh, and I think things like this will probably persist for quite some period of time and allow us to get back to normal operations much more quickly than, than we normally, than we otherwise would. Thank you. So we have some phenomenal questions rolling in. Uh, we are going to go over time. Um, so if you're willing to stick with us, we'll continue to answer as many as we think would be beneficial to the whole group. Um, I'm going to try and save a record of all these questions and for things that we don't get to, um, I'll try and see if we can address them uh, for you guys in another form. Um, I saw one question about whether or not um, remote reading or teleradiology will, it will impact the quality of the care that we provide. And I'd like to address that because um, I'm a radiologist for the Radiology Partners Matrix Division, which means all of our work is remote and teleradiology. Um, I think at the end of the day, we're physicians and we take great pride in our work and we're willing to be flexible to continue to provide service with the challenges at hand. And whether or not you are a regular teleradiologist like myself and used to working from home or working from home is a new challenge that you're undertaking, I think we're all committed to quality. Um, and personally, I have not seen a um, detrimental impact on quality of the care that we're providing. So I hope that continues to be the case. Um, let's go back to uh, Dr. Humans. Did you have a question you'd like to address? Sure, I'll put a couple of these together and let me draw back up here. We had uh, two questions that um, were related to one another, one from Joa Wazen and one from Z Zachary Jang. Uh, Zachary's question is, have you seen similar recovery in IR procedure volumes similar to diagnostic volumes? 
And Joelle asks about the outlook for recruiting non-physician radiology providers uh, versus radiologists, given the fact that, as she says, many practices may need to make modifications. First, let me say that IR procedures um, are uh, definitely coming back. Um, unlike a lot of diagnostic procedures where people may feel better and not need to come back for that chest x-ray or that ultrasound, uh, IR is really not like that. So I predict and I'm seeing that IR procedures are coming back uh, with a vengeance. Some people are delaying um, their treatment and unfortunately that um, brings them to us a little bit more quickly sometimes and brings them back with a little bit more complex um, need for treatment. Uh, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is very yes. Um, with respect to Joel's question about non-physician radiology providers, I could tell you that people um, across the country uh, practice to practice feel very differently about the value uh, of this and whether it actually prov provides uh, or poses a threat to us as radiologists. I personally think that if I can get somebody to do something very, very well that will allow me to do things that I'm good at and are more complex, more often and better. Uh, I'm in support of it. So our practice does have some non-physician radiology providers. We, um, uh, I foresee them as remaining very, very important to our practice, but I don't see them threatening um, anything that we do with the exception of things that are very, very simple and straightforward and that we could have done after your medical school quite easily. Uh, so I don't see them as a threat. As a matter of fact, I see them as freeing me up to um, expand on other opportunities. Um, and, uh, and free me up to, to do some more interesting and uh, complex work. Thank you, Dr. Humans. Uh, Dr. Nalam Shetty, would you like to address the question at hand? Uh, sure, uh, Elizabeth. Um, so there's a couple here that are specific to radiology partners. So I'm trying to group those together. Um, there was a question about leadership opportunities and how do physicians get involved uh, in such a large organization. Um, to answer that question, uh, as I mentioned, the way that uh, radiology partners is structured all of our independent practices work independently. We call it a one practice locally led model. So meaning it's a national practice, but each practice within RP functions independently. But we have uh, national support boards for every function within radiology. So things such as uh, human resources, there's a support board, recruiting, growth, um, IT, AI. And those support boards are comprised of a group of physicians from all of our practices combined. Um, it's typically anywhere from eight to 10 physicians, plus some administrators who work with us to come up with the strategic initiatives for the organization. So there's plenty of opportunities to do that. Um, currently, I think there's over 50 physicians within radiology partners from all of our practices that serve in these roles. And these are uh, termed roles. So it's not something that you get in there for the rest of your life. Uh, so there's plenty of opportunities for younger physician leaders to get involved within the organization. Along those lines, the second question was regarding partnership tracks. Um, so uh, within Radiology Partners, my practice uh, has a partnership track, and I don't really see a lot of changes secondary to COVID. I have not heard that from other practices. I think practices that were hiring on partnership tracks are continuing to do so, and there hasn't been any change um, in terms of the length of partnership tracks. So I think that's, that's a good sign. Um, I think because we're seeing such a quick recovery, I think people are realizing that we need to keep uh, aggressively hiring and aggressively recruiting uh, folks like you all into our practices. Um, there's one more, Elizabeth, if you don't mind. Um, there was one question on uh, retirement. Uh, is there, because of this pandemic, are physicians delaying retirement, which would decrease job opportunities for younger radiologists? And I think it's a mixed bag. You know, Dr. Eumanns mentioned that in some cases, folks may be looking at it and saying that their retirement funds may have depleted and they want to stay on for a few extra months. I've seen the opposite in my practice where uh, physicians are saying, you know, the risk of coming into work and the risk of the COVID pandemic, I was close to retirement to begin with. This is actually going to expedite uh, my retirement. Um, so I think it works both ways and individual situations are going to dictate that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Warren, would you like to take a question? Sure. I was going to answer the one from uh, Edward Bachman asking about what's the prediction for outpatient imaging volumes and the new normal. And I was going to use this as uh, just a little bit of a reminder that, you know, we're one half of the equation, that, that what we do uh, and what we plan for from the radiology side uh, is certainly a component of the recovery, but we also need to keep in mind that patients are a consenting and assenting component of a back-to-work, uh, back-to-business strategy. 
And so we found that there's a significant amount of work that needs to be done with reassuring the patients that we understand their concerns and are creating a safe environment and a welcoming environment for them. So a good example of this is that our hospital had initially gone on a no visitor policy. And, uh, you know, for good reason, we didn't want extra people coming into the hospital. And so you go to the website and it says we have a new visitor policy, no visitors allowed, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, somebody made the point, you know, that's not exactly reassuring or wel welcoming to the patient. It's very off-putting. And it really just is a matter of, of looking at how you phrase it and how you present it to say, we're concerned with your safety. And for that reason, we're taking the following measures to ensure the health of everybody involved. So it, an interesting uh, survey has been done here in the Houston area, looking at patient confidence with various medical environments. And particularly with regards to this question, they found that the environment that patients were most comfortable uh, re-entering was a private physician office that they felt best going to a small facility, open parking, walk in, get in, get your procedure, see the physician, be on your way, rather than coming to a busy medical center, certainly going into an emergency room. And so to that question, I think we saw the biggest impact on volumes in the outpatient setting during the acute phase of the COVID pandemic. But there are reasons to believe that that is an environment where patients will have a high degree of confidence coming back in for their procedures uh, once the COVID situation starts to dissipate as it is now. Um, and so I'm very, again, optimistic that, that we'll see a resumption of activity in the outpatient volume. And I see no reason to think that it's going to be any more affected than, than the inpatient side of the operation. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll take a question from Dr. Kelly that just came in. I think it's really pertinent to all of us at every stage of our career. He asked, how have you managed the stress of the new and hopefully temporary realities of work-life balance and other challenges right now, both on a personal and a team level? Um, I think that's a really fantastic question and it's gonna differ a little bit for everyone depending on their needs. Um, Culture-wise, internal to radiology partners, we have the culture and leadership board um, that's a physician support board that helps to put out uh, different events, different materials, different newsletters to help radiologists and other support teammates identify ways to manage stress and manage work-life balance. Uh, we also have RP1, which helps relieve some financial stress that people might be undergoing. Um, we also have internal coaching circles, which are 360 evaluations and allow each of us to bounce off um, ideas and concepts off of one another. And then we also have the usual social things that this week we're having RP's Got Talent, where we're gonna have a virtual talent show where we can just get together and celebrate and um, build some camaraderie and be together. Whether or not you're in RP or not within RP, I think now more than ever, we need to connect with one another, whether that's virtually, um, uh, through written word, through spoken word, through video, um, feeling the support from one another is critical. And I think that's also why it's so incredibly valuable that each of you are joining with us tonight and hopefully feeling some support and some optimism as we talk about what's going on. Uh, we'll continue for a few more if you'd like to keep hanging in there. Um, Elizabeth, I see a really good question, if you don't mind, that I think all of us should address. Go for it, please. It's, it's pertinent to the, the, the topic of tonight. The question was, as somebody looking for a job, how do I evaluate different practices and different work uh, environments to help make a decision for to be in the best practice? And so maybe I thought that might be a good question for each of us to give some perspective. Um, you know, I kind of, uh, maybe I'll start. Um, I, I thought, I mentioned the, the diversification uh, comment several times during my talk. Um, well, that was a feature that I was really looking for when I when I came out of a fellowship and, and was looking for jobs. So uh, some uh, a practice that had outpatient, inpatient, potentially teleradiology and academic, if you can get something that does all of that, great, um, versus putting everything in one specific environment. And I think all of you are in a very fortunate position because you can ask the question to all the employers that you're looking at, how did you guys handle the COVID pandemic? What happened to your practice? And you have to gauge whether or not they had made the investments in the infrastructure to help support their practice for times like these, or if they were scrambling at the very end when this hit, realizing they didn't have access to home workstations, they didn't have um, resources locally to help manage their practice. 
So I think those are all really good questions and, and it's one that is extremely pertinent to the current times. So maybe with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to somebody else to, to share their thoughts. Yeah, I can piggyback on that if you don't mind. That's a terrific answer. Um, it's funny, that is actually what I consider to be one of the silver linings of this pandemic for you all. Over the next couple of few years, you're gonna have the opportunity to ask that question. It's very, it's very awkward to walk in and say, hey, how financially stable are you? Or uh, how much debt do you have? Those kinds of questions don't get answered and the people you ask probably won't know the answers to those. But, but this, this situation offers exactly that opportunity. You can look folks in the eye and say, hey, you guys just went through an extremely difficult time. How did you deal with staff being overstaffed? What happened to the younger folks? Is there somebody I can talk to to get a sense of how they felt about it? How did you, how hard was it to get the kind of loan money that you needed? Those are general questions and they become less personalized as a result of, uh, of this pandemic. So I think if you're thoughtful, if you're respectful um, and you are sort of depersonalizing those questions, you probably have the opportunity to ask those even more than, than I did when I was uh, interviewing. Yeah, I agree. Those are, those are great answers and that's a, uh, a great perspective you know every every practice is going to have a story to tell and if you listen and kind of read between the lines i think you'll learn a lot about the culture of that practice and you know what they did the whole um you know rp1 is a good example you know a practice under duress financial strain you know people being put on furloughs and being asked to make sacrifices uh you know it, it really shows a lot about an organization and i think we all have stories from within our organizations about how we banded together uh, Nobody's going to give you the, the dirty laundry when you ask that question, but I think by asking the question and listening closely as they answer, you'll be able to, to gain some really good information. Thank you so much. Um, I'll take a quick question. Is RP using AI or planning to use AI in the future? Uh, we are under the hood of a principle called OPAL, which is one practice locally led, which means a lot of our practices make their own uh, decisions of how they want to operate clinically. I can speak to our internal practice, which is the matrix division, and we do use AI. Uh, in fact, we have a homegrown AI technique called RecoMD, which is speech recognition, and helps to input our best practices. It's a great question to ask, particularly when you're uh, looking at different employment opportunities for the future. Um, we'll continue on for just a little bit longer. We're gonna wrap it up shortly. Um, do any of the panelists have any questions that you think would be of great benefit for the entire group to hear? Um, Dr. Humans, are there any final questions you'd like to address? Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of concern about um, whether practices are going to continue to hire. Um, my, I feel confident that most of the things that will instill confidence in practice leaders will um, be back by mid to late fall. So people with a look at the long horizon aren't gonna change their hiring practices a great deal unless they're afraid of bringing someone in um, who might be left with an unstable intermediate future for several months where they're afraid they don't wanna bring somebody out, start them and then find they have to scale them back when they're vulnerable from a financial or a social standpoint. But in general, uh, I think that um, you're gonna see the whole hiring curve remain very similar to what it would have been, but just shift on the order of maybe 12 to 18 months. And that, that curve will look different for each of you, depending on where you decide you wanna work and under what circumstances. Um, so, so yeah, again, you're gonna to need to be flexible. You're gonna to need to have some fallback plans or some um, thoughts about how to adjust to uncertainty. Uh, your experience will definitely be different from mine, but I suspect and I'm confident that if you look back 10 years, you're not gonna think of it, you'll remember this period for sure but you won't think of it as a game changer for your, for your career or for your future. Thank you. I'll uh, let each of our panelists take one final question. Dr. Roran, did you have one final question you wanted to address? No, I was just gonna second that, that, that I think this is a, a bump in the road and that bump will be less visible as we move forward into the future. I think we all will remember this. I mean, these pandemics come along once a century, hopefully not any more uh, frequently than that, uh, but I'm, not going to be a lasting impact on our field of radiology or the field of medicine in general. Fantastic. Thank you. Dr. Nalan Shetty, did you have a final question you wanted to address? 
more of a comment, uh, Elizabeth. So I, I think um, for for all of you, it, it's a very unique time in in in, um, in medicine, um, and I think what you, you're going to see as you enter the job market now is that whichever practice you choose to join, I think is gonna be better positioned to handle things in the future than they've ever been before. Um, practices have had to adapt significantly, whether it was technology-based, whether it was resource-based, financially based, and they've had to make adjustments very quickly. Um, and I think now that you're entering that market, you could, you could feel more secure about your decision um, because I think if you can withstand this type of direct blow in a very short period of time, you're going to be better positioned than you've ever been in any practice uh, to handle the future. Great point. Thank you so much. Um, the picture that I referenced on my wall that says the future belongs to the brave hang ne hangs next to a couple other pictures, one of which says you are exactly where you're supposed to be, and the other one says you've got this. And I would remind all of you that you've got this. Thank you for being brave and for being with us tonight. Um, this is just the beginning of the conversation. So we're all here to talk with you more. Please engage us in conversation. There are some fantastic questions that we did not get to and I apologize for that. We have them written down. We'll try and address them as best we can. So thank you for being with us tonight. I wish you all the best and I look forward to speaking with all of you more. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you and good night. Good night all. Be well.